Hello, everyone, and welcome to our ADB seminar on building back greener with nature-based solutions. My name is Agnieszka Gajewska, and I'm the global leader for government and public services at PwC. We will be spending like an hour or so um, discussing with a distinguished uh, panelist today what nature-based solutions really are, uh, how we should mainstream them more in the way how we think about net zero and how we build our infrastructure, thinking about financing, uh, regulation and other important things that make uh, nature-based solutions a real mainstream. Um, ADB is a big promoter of nature-based solutions. Uh, with a recent report, they were showing how much uh, nature-based so solutions can uh, really impact the way we are thinking about uh, um, net zero, but also how it can promote uh, uh, sustainable development, uh, not only in the cities, but also in the rural areas. Um, I am joined today uh, by uh, three fantastic uh, subject matter experts in the area. So let me welcome here Professor Marua Mukherjee. Uh, sorry, Marua, I hope I um, pronounced your, your name uh, correctly. Marua is a professor at the AAT Rukri. Uh, I'm also um, joined today by Tom Williams. Uh, Tom is representing World Business Council for Sustainable Development. And last but not least, Daniel Lipschitz, um, representing Biosphera Foundation. Welcome, and thank you so much for accepting my invitation to join this panel today. Guys, uh, as I said, we will, we will start uh, um, the conversation around uh, nature-based solutions. And I thought uh, maybe let's kick off by you introducing um, yourself and giving us a little bit more insights of what you really do and how your professional life is connected with nature-based solutions. Mahua, if okay, I, I will start with you. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Uh, let us start with the very basic, because nature-based solutions, we are using the term so often. So let us have some clarity on this term. It's nothing new probably. Many things had happened previously. We are bringing it forward. Nature-based solution, the phrase itself suggests that it's having the natural elements. Natural elements like art or matter. Uh, in, as for the Indian philosophy, it is Shiti, Ab, Tej, Marut, Bom. That is Ab, Water, radiation, wind, and space, these are the five elements. Uh, so these five elements are actually having the entire role for this entire world. And while we are now looking back, back at the nature-based solution, because we have certain problem where we need the solutions. So let us have that context. That context is, let's say, if we talk about the urbanization, today's urbanization, if we talk about the increase in disaster risk or the climate change, uh, so these are the aspects which we can actually look at how we are now looking at, looking back at the nature-based solutions so that we not only get the advantage of presence of nature, but we can also utilize its services for our uh, solving this problem. So there is a sense of emergency. This context is very important. When we look at the nature-based solution, many different definitions are available. Mostly when we look at it, IUCN, the intergovernmental agency, talks uh, gives us a very wonderful definition where it talks about the protection, management, and restoration of natural elements for the benefit of human beings, the human society primarily. And that is a very clear indication that from the previous uh, philosophy of managing the, uh, or preserving the natural elements is different from NBS. NBS is looking at linking the services for the human society and the benefit of the society. There are several terminologies or several approaches which can be accommodated within this umbrella term of nature-based solution. It can be ecosystem-based approaches, uh, like we can go for eco-DRR, ecosystem-based uh, uh, 
adaptation, ecosystem based management, or we can go for the ecosystem function based, uh, this uh, uh, four services we can talk about. We can talk about different management system depending on this ecosystem like integrated coastal management like this. So there are many different groups who are working with this ecosystem based uh, or I will say the umbrella term. Like today, another very important uh, category has come up under NBS, that is the infrastructure. As we were referring to the urbanization, this uh, green infrastructure, blue infrastructure, blue green infrastructure, they are becoming very, very pertinent part of today's discussion and solution. So I believe with that, we can go forward, Aga. Uh, thank you so much, Mahua. I will come back to this, uh, you know, green and grey and blue infrastructure and, and ask you another question. But before I do this, Daniel, maybe I will um, and get back to you. Uh, Mahua gave us a little bit of, a, you know, overview and demystified a little bit what nature-based solutions really are. Daniel, so what is what are you doing at Biosphera and, and uh, how are NBS so important for you? Okay, uh, just in a nutshell about uh, Biosphera. Biosphera was founded in 2012 in Brazil, <clears throat> initially as a think tank for uh, politics and academia on how to address and introduce and implement anything and all to do with resource economy and resource economics. Um, in 2014, uh, we, um, from a think tank, we switched to a foundation and knowledge center headquartered here in the Netherlands. And throughout the years, we have developed something. And I personally, as the president of the foundation, um, have this in my portfolio, is what we call the smart ecosystem engineering agenda. And smart ecosystem engineering has a number of vantage points that are very resonant with and also include mainstreaming nature-based solutions. So to expand a little bit upon uh, uh, the great demystification of, of, of uh, MAWA, what are nature-based solutions? I think also for the audience, maybe it's important to understand um, what are ecosystem services and ecosystem assets, because we have to differentiate between them. And Ecosystem assets, they can be defined in all um, those assets that we humans need in order for our sheer survival, but also to thrive. Think about um, fertile soils for our, uh, for our uh, nutrition. Think about clay on the riverbank for construction materials. Even think about ores in the ground. Think about wood in the, in the forest, et cetera, et cetera. So we can look at this as ecosystem assets and in the context of resource economics and for instance natural capital since 2012 we see that there has been an enormous improvement in being able to value and quantify and evaluate um, these ecosystem assets they are distinct from ecosystem services because ecosystem services typically are the mechanics and dynamics by which ecosystems maintain and sustain, let's say, the delivery of those ecosystem assets. So I, I just think it's important and smart ecosystem engineering really is focused towards anything and uh, all to do with uh, developing and providing enabling platforms and frameworks through the whole column. So this is from high level consultancy with governments, with IFIs, with international organizations, all the way to the work on the ground, in the field, vis-a-vis -vis local communities and local governments for implementing showcases. If we talk about the period from 2012 through, I'd say, largely 2016. But then also looking at the upscaling of nature-based solutions. That, in a nutshell, is what uh, uh, my organization and I myself am committed to and work on on a daily basis. Thanks so much, Daniel. And I will, you know, come back to many of uh, topics that you were referring to uh, right now. Tom, uh, before I, uh, you know, go any further, I also wanted to ask you what you what you do. I think Mahua and, and Daniel gave us great overview of what nature-based solutions really are, and a little bit from the academia perspective, a little bit from the foundation uh, perspective. You are representing World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and you know, your organization has business. 
um, in its in its uh, name. Uh, it means that uh, nature-based solutions are also something that business is seriously thinking about. Give us a little bit of overview why uh, nature-based solutions are important for business. Yeah, thanks, Arga, um, and thanks for the invitation to join this discussion today. So the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, or WBCSD, we're a membership organization with over 220 companies working across different sectors and geographies. Um, we're CEO led. So the CEOs or C-level executives of our members engage directly with us, which gives us great leverage um, with our companies. And our work is, is oriented towards addressing our three big challenges today, the climate crisis, nature loss, and growing inequality. And nature-based solutions is really exciting for us because investing in MBS can support business in all three of those areas, climate action, nature action, and equity action. Over the last five years or so, we've primarily been focusing on nature-based solutions for net zero commitments. That's where we see the momentum at the moment. That's where we see a lot of the finance. What we're starting to see more of is how nature positive and how social commitments are also driving investments in nature-based solutions. So we're working with our member companies on how they develop a strategic investment plan for nature-based solutions that are good for climate and biodiversity and social outcomes. And there's a number of key developments and frameworks um, and best practices that I can touch on later. But that gives you a little bit of a snapshot in terms of how we're working with our members and, and where their investments in, in nature-based solutions are oriented towards. Thank you so much, Tom. And indeed, I will be absolutely fascinated to hear more about, you know, how business is involved into this and uh, this famous from billions to trillions. So uh, we shall see whether it is really uh, any possibility and opportunity for private investors to get involved. Now, I will, I will maybe come back to you right now. During your intro intervention, you, you started talking about uh, blue-green infrastructure and, and also how nature-based solutions are really a great uh, opportunity in this space. Could you give us some relevant examples of uh, you know, how um, uh, governments, how local governments, how municipalities are um, really including these nature-based solutions in the way they think about the infrastructure? And second thing that is uh, um, uh, equally interesting for me, I, I want you to refer to this uh, ADB report uh, that was uh, published around, you know, uh, a great green or, um, or how to make sure that we are thinking about this uh, um, green and blue infrastructure. I, I would say probably for many of our audience, uh, green and blue infrastructure, I think we, we, you know, we might know, but we know what it is. But again, it would be great to get a little bit of this demystification from you, understanding what this really is and how relevant nature-based solutions are for us uh, thinking about uh, blue-green infrastructure. Thank you, Aga. Again, a very interesting part of this NBS is going to be understanding this. Initially, we used to talk about gray and green, these solutions in silos. Now we gradually understood because as I told you, uh, solutions are required because we already understood. We are already reached at a very, very difficult period. Whether it is the increase in urban risks or whether it is the disaster or climate change in induced issues. So there we can see more and more uh, it's, it's rather a necessity, uh, whether it comes from the local government, whether it comes from the other stakeholders, to understand how best we can do this. Uh, even the gray infrastructure, that is the engineered infrastructure, can always take advantage of the nature-based solution. Because we can start, let's say, in the hill area, when we go for the road, the, any transportation corridor can take advantage of the natural slopes, the drainage. We can consider them, we start with that, and then accordingly we bring our engineering solutions. So there is always a scope for having a gray and green. And as you rightly pointed out, the ADB's very recent report in June has wonderfully deliberated on that aspect. I would rather uh, like to deliberate slightly differently like as I come from architecture and planning, let us discuss that how we can really include it. Daniel was discussing about the upscaling. So you have to really go for the planning and design. I always advocate, let us go for mediation. 
M, E, and D, all three capital. M stands for monitoring, E stands for evaluation, and D stands for the design evaluation. So these are the three major pillars for NBS, nature-based solution, and BGI is one of the strong pillar of that. What I try to talk about uh, under that monitoring, in today's time, getting data, that obstacle we can always, because data itself an issue, especially when we are working in the South Asia or Asia maybe. So, but again, the earth observation data can be a very wonderful tool for us. We at IIT Rurki, we have worked with UN Spider, uh, UN Office of Outer Space experts, and we have developed a earth observation data and image analysis that we have integrated on the GIS. And we have been able to look at both the sides, not only the solution side, but also the problem side. So these are, we are not alone. Many such initiatives are going on. As we are uh, hearing Tom that investments are coming, we could see so many startups are coming and who are walking into this innovative technology, which are being used for the mainstreaming NBS. Uh, it's IoT, it's the sensors, it's the different vessels are being used on the water body so that real-time data can be monitored. So many things are happening, like as I was mentioning, we have developed a tool which is geospatial mapping of natural elements, geosynatic, and we are using it for many different places. And the scale can be local level to the city level. So many such uh, different type of uh, tools are available in today's time to monitor the health and the growth. So this is going to help us both for the problem identification as well as to look at how the solutions can work. That's Thank you so much, Noah. It's, it's very, very interesting. And I will also share my point of view. So I have more than 20 years of experience in uh, consulting on infrastructure projects, including also infrastructure funding and financing, working quite a lot with international financing institutions and donors clearly, you know, like uh, having the infrastructure that is blue and green and actually, in, you know, this uh, impact on negative impact on uh, environment is minimized. It's, it's not something new to me. So, you know, over the last 20 years, this is exactly what we were um, asked about. And I think what really differentiates your approach to, you know, approach that I've seen in the past is first of all, the, the discipline. So you're saying, you know, you, you need to have it from the very beginning, the way you think about it, the way you design it, the way you build it, finance it, and also monitor it and have this consistency. So I, I think it's, a, as you said, it's maybe not something totally new, but the process, the way of thinking, that discipline and consistency is something that I understand uh, differentiates your approach from, from what we've seen in the past. Yeah, thanks. And if, if you allow me, I would also like to elaborate this uh, MED, the evaluation and the design ideation part. Very quickly, I would like to go through that. Evaluation means we don't only value them, value these na natural elements, we also try to evaluate their performances. Daniel was talking about TSS. We have heard and we have also seen a lot of several, uh, I will say, that uh, systematic approaches are already in place. And again, the new technologies have helped to bring that work forward. And that is very much required because now the pressure is more acute than previous era. So when we look at the solution tools like INVEST, which is a natural a product of a natural capital project, and where we can see the valuation of this uh, natural uh, elements, ecosystem services, they are wonderful tools. And again, I can uh, tell you confidently that many such startups are coming up who are offering these services to the governments, local governments, and different offices. Different, even the academicians, they are also in the field. So evaluation makes it very, very, I will say, from intangible to the tangible 
it's very important move and that really makes it a very strong i will say say step forward for mainstreaming nbs yeah thanks Thank you so much. I, I think it's really fascinating and I want to come back to you about, you know, this upscaling. So how to make sure that we go from the, um, you know, startups to uh, big businesses and making sure that um, nature-based solutions get the financing and scale that is needed to uh, address the world's problem. And, and this is a very beautiful segue, Daniel, to you, because uh, I must tell you, I, you know, I was preparing to this, uh, to this um, panel and I read somewhere that uh, 37 percent of the mitigation needed until 2030 uh, you know to meet our Paris um, agreement um, um, targets can come from nature-based solutions I must tell you you know it's not something new to me but when I when I saw this number I said like my goodness, it's, it's, it's really huge. It's not, it doesn't seem to me like it's nice to have. It seems like something that should be really in the, in the mainstream of um, us thinking about both mitigation and adaptation. Would you like to give a little bit flavor on this? Yes, yes. Uh, um, I, I think that's a, that's a very good point. Um, of course, mainstreaming uh, NBS is a major um, topic, let's say, both in the geopolit geopolitical setting, but also if we look at the larger systemic um, climate setting, um, we see now that um, the, the um, uh, compromising of ecosystemic integrity is, uh, is really compromised uh, all over the world. There is not one country where there is sort of a um, reality that calls for solutions beyond business as usual. And, um, well, maybe that also would be an, an interesting discussion vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, for instance, PwC, um, is um, the, the willingness to go beyond uh, models, uh, frameworks, platforms uh, be, of business as usual. This is what will allow us to fulfill that 37% of uh, current global solutions coming out, let's say, of the uh, NBS kitchen. Having said that, um, business as usual, of course, is tied in with our economic narratives and nature-based solutions, just to backtrack a little bit and also expand upon the, the great demystification of MAWA about, about NBS as such. Um, we have to, of course, understand that the moment we factor in uh, ecosystem assets and ecosystem services, that we need a corresponding econ economic narrative that can actually facilitate the uh, monetary quantification of assets and services coming out of natural the natural environment can really become a uh, not only um, let's say an interesting investment option but also is translated in all the different political agendas be they regional be they national be they international Having said that, like some of the some of the let's say limiting factors in that um, are are pretty much as philosophical as they are practical. So one of the limiting factors, I think, is is, is basically our difficulty as humans to um, to overcome compartmentalization and silos. And the first vantage points in that pretty much is that we differentiate between a built environment and a natural environment. So the built environment typically is where we are all in with our high-tech infrastructure. We can, you know, facilitate a, a, a fantastic uh, um, a panel discussion on MBS as today, whereas the natural environment is somewhere out there. Of course, this is not true. And um, we have to start to recognize that we are part and parcel of the natural ecosystems that sustain and um, support us and that within that ecosystem, there is a dynamic balance by which at all points in time, the distribution of value, and when we talk about value, let's express it, for instance, in water, energy, nutrients, and waste. So this dynamic ecosystem balance or a natural balance, if you will, um, at all times is optimal in its distribution of value amongst the organisms that it supports and nothing goes to waste. So if we talk about really making not maybe uh, steps forward on MBS, but really being able to jump forward, we have to 
um, start to really think in those metabolic loops. Now, for instance, a practice outside of uh, 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 nature-based solutions where this is really already mainstreamed is um, a sector like circular economy. So there's quite a number of fields that need to be taken in account um, to break through what I would call what we're looking at, uh, and that's also uh, already Mawa mentioned that uh, a sense of urgency and emergency is that what I call sort of the, the wheels, or call it, if you will, the loops between disaster re recovery and disaster risk reduction, they're out of sync. Let's take the flooding in Pakistan, just as an example. So, you know, um, we, it's just staggering to understand what will be needed in order to recover from that uh, environmental disaster. But then if you look at the time needed also to implement nature-based solutions that can help to mitigate and uh, reduce future disaster risks, these things are not in sync. And they're not in sync, let's say, um, all the way upstream, downstream, in the whole um, uh, intersectoral and um, uh, let's say multi-departmental, if you talk about governments, we are not outfitted yet and we don't have the tools and platforms to accelerate um, and come to this 37% of global solutions coming out of nature-based solutions. So sorry for the, the bit philosophical contextualization, but I think it's important for the understanding to, to, to have this contextualization in the right way. You know, Daniel, it was both philosophical, but also hugely practical, I would say, what, what you just say. So, yes, I understand that, that this, this is something that we need to almost like quick click our mindset to make sure that we are not looking at either or. So it is nature and technology. Now I was talking so much about you know, technology, startups and so on. But actually, I, I think generally we have this, this tendency of... Uh, thinking in silos. So if it is like nature-based, that it is nature, yes, it is out there. If we are here investors, you know, uh, consultants, uh, financiers, uh, it needs to be tough, it needs to be expensive, it, you know, it, it, it will make a real impact. Whereas, what, as I understood you, what you are saying is that it really is an ecosystem and we need both. And, and this is where really we can get to this 37%, which I believe if, if it is really the case, it will be like a fantastic, fantastic results. Daniel, one comment or question I would have to you, you know, many people are asking, is it expensive? So um, when we're looking at NBS, is it something that we can afford? Uh, is almost like when you look at, the, you said that, uh, you know, lots of uh, uh, work that you do um, is around uh, impact assessment and, and making sure that uh, we have understanding how we are spending our money. Does it really count? Uh, does it is it really like the best way of spending our money, given how much needs to be done? Well, uh, that that's a great question, Aga. I'd say the question whether NBS is expensive or not is the, the literally the million dollar question here. Um, maybe um, to 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 be very practical about this, um, there is a certain um, spectrum in let's say the range and scope, but also the, the, um, the cost structure of uh, the development and implementation of nature-based solutions. First of all, you know, just to demystify a bit further, nature-based solutions are nothing new. I'd say that the use of um, ecosystem services and assets and uh, having a human effort to support them and uh, maintain them is as old as mankind. It is something that you know, we need for our sheer survival on this planet. Having said that, um, we have gone so far in this differentiation between built and natural environment that, let's say, our um, uh, uh, engineered infrastructures do not correlate anymore um, with the natural ecosystems. And I'm not necessarily saying that there is an ecosystem collapse, let's say, from a planetary point of view, but we are very vulnerable within those ecosystems, and those are the hits we are taking currently. Having said that, um, the cost structure of nature-based solution and whether it's expensive or not very much depends on whether you are willing to factor in the cost reduction. So the reduction of loss of life and material damage as a result of flooding, drought, uh, forest fire, 
uh, uh, EU, uh, loss of biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. Once we factor in those costs, the cost structure looks very different. And then also many times, and still there is, and this comes from the time when payment for ecosystem services was really developed and also mainstreamed in natural capital as a means to finance nature-based solutions. But um, I can give some examples, for instance, where you have um, exactly what Mawa also talked about, because we have to look how we are going to integrate our gray, let's say, um, not as smart as nature, engineered infrastructure with those blue and green smart um, ecosystem infrastructures. So just to, and exactly on this integration, I think there lays also the possibility to showcase, um, uh, roll out and upskill solutions that basically pay for themselves. I give one example. So um, together with uh, one of our partner uh, organizations, Biopolis, uh, so there's Biopolis Institute in Budapest and also a commercial firm. Um, we jointly developed um, uh, the outlook and they did all the technical development and the implementation of what's called metabolic network reactors. Now, what is a metabolic network reactor? It's nothing else than a distributed um, grid of um, uh, wastewater treatment plants. So these STPs, they typically are using um, a, a high-tech um, component which um, increases the root surface of a whole catalog of plants um, with a ratio of 1 to 10,000. So basically we use the ecosystem surfaces of root surfaces to host uh, microbial organisms that can deal with any and all pollutants in sewage. But in the process, we are left with uh, valuable uh, biological and chemical components that then can be pre-processed, sold off to different industries. And in the process, we also generate um, electricity plus um, clean and potable water. So depending where you are in the world, um, you can also sell off different water products, including supply water if there isn't a um, regulatory framework that um, prohibits the use of wastewater for the production of potable water. To make a long story short, if you look at the initial investment for such an uh, MNR, as we call it, the, the metabolic network reactor, um, you have a return uh, of investment typically within three years. And after that, by the selling off of pre-processed uh, chemical compounds and biological compounds for a different range of industry, by selling off the water products, by generating electricity, you not only have, let's say, a net positive outcome, it becomes a business in itself. And these type of businesses where we integrate uh, BGI with gray infrastructure using engineered forms of NBS, to coin a term, we see that typically that also creates a great platform for engagement between private ventures and um, uh, public utilities. Um, so that's sort of a win-win-win. The ecosystem wins, the um, public sector and public utility sector wins, plus the private sector wins because it's a profitable venture. So let's say that that at the sort of current state of, um, uh, let's say, uh, state of the art and a bit beyond state of the art, um, NBS, that type of um, examples would fit very well. But then there's the other side of the spectrum. Now, I'm, I'm Dutch, I'm talking for you uh, through the Netherlands, and let's not forget that the Netherlands, um, in order to you know, be able to live in this, in this country, we needed to use NBS in order to protect ourselves from uh, the sea, but also in order to create arable land you know, for us to survive. And this goes back almost a millennium. So just a very simple, and if you talk about whether NBS is expensive or not, so this is a nice example. So most of the pollering, as it's called, so that is the, um, the uh, keeping at bay um, search flooding, but also create new arable land is done by uh, what's called STU sediment uh, trapping units. Now, what's the sediment trapping units? It's just like a small fence made out of twigs or bamboo or wherever you are in the world. And what happens is that the sediment is trapped as the, um, as the uh, seawater comes in and creates 
uh, both a protection against uh, storm surges, but it also increases the biodiversity, for instance, for uh, all kinds of uh, seafood and fish. Plus, it enhances also the hinterlying arable land and creates a, a higher fertility of the soil. Now, I'm not saying that um, the Batavians in the Netherlands a thousand years ago thought this all through, but by trial and error, this practice was created. Now, um, uh, the, the sector organization for the Dutch water sector, the Netherlands Water Partnership, um, a, a number of the big players in that, so these are companies like uh, Van Noort, Boscalis, Royal Haskoning, DHV, let's say, are multinationals in the Dutch water sector, um, have created a platform called EcoShape Building with Nature. And we just ventured out um, looking at a specific uh, 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 on the ground challenge in a uh, area of Indonesia where we could use this, um, these STUs, these sediment uh, uh, trapping units, to provide for coastal protection, to increase biodiversity, to um, play a significant role in the restoration of mangrove forests and create new livelihoods for the local communities, not only through, let's say, the new business of placing in strategic places the STUs and also the maintenance and upkeep of them, but the increase of biodiversity in the sea. So this comes um, to the benefit of local fishermen and uh, new parts of arable land. Um, so this comes to the benefit of the uh, local farming communities um, and the cost of a stretching meter of STU by this technology is one and a half dollar, including sort of the payment to the people that put them. So this gives sort of, let's say the, the, the um, I'm not saying the, 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 let's say this covers the whole spectrum. So anything about the traditional STUs being used outside of the Dutch context and the metabolic network reactors, which are really a showcase for the integration of gray uh, infrastructure and BGI. Um, anything in between, we can see as um, nature-based solutions. And as I said in the beginning, sort of to close the loop is that when we are willing, when there is the economic will, when there is, let's say, the will from the private sector and all the stakeholders involved in um, meeting the, 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 the global challenges at hand, and we can factor in um, the, the, the costs of loss of life and material damage as a result of climate change, let's put it in this way, then I'd say um, NBS definitely is a profitable venture and is not more or less expensive than any other um, technology or practice from any other sector. Daniel, we were a couple of really absolutely amazing examples that you gave us, and, and I think it, it made me think, I hope it was equally interesting for our audience. It made me also think how important, absolutely essential it is to capture the whole spectrum of value if we are talking about the nature-based solutions. And the, clearly, great segue to have conversation right now with Tom, because Tom, you, you interact quite a lot with private investors. Uh, I, in my own experience, also interact well, both with inter institutional investors, but also with private investors. And clearly, all of them have right now like huge appetite um, to get involved and uh, finance um, broadly this, the, define sustainable solutions. And we are seeing, you know, like proliferation of sustainable funds, people talking about it. It seems to me that it is, and when we really are um, serious about nature-based solutions, that we need to find the tools to be really able to measure, make a decision, but also then to monitor how um, your investments is really impacting um, uh, the sustainability as such, and also how it uh, how it uh, relates to your um, expected rate of, rate of returns, not only in financial sense but also beyond it. I know that you are involved in this, so I think it would be really great to hear from you how you believe this quite complicated interactions and ecosystem can be quantified and uh, put in, in some um, objective measurements. Yeah, great question. Thanks, Arda. And, and maybe I can start by building on that economic narrative that Daniel was describing. 
and take a step back and understand that over half of the world's total GDP is, is dependent on nature. The food we eat, the goods we buy, and the environments we live in have a significant impact and dependencies on nature. You know, the existing model, as, as Daniel was alluding to, of, of economic development is depleting our natural capital and it's, it's no longer sustainable. And business is waking up to this, particularly from a risk uh, perspective. And what we're starting to see now is, is more of a collective response to this through the development of business focused tools and frameworks that support business action uh, on nature. And one such framework is the Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures or uh, TNFD. So this is a risk management and disclosure framework for business to report and act on evolving nature related risks. And it has the ultimate aim of supporting a shift in global financial flows away from nature negative outcomes and towards nature positive outcomes. At WBCSD, we're working with over 25 of our companies uh, to pilot the framework ahead of its finalization uh, in September next year. And we are already starting to see how this framework might be mandated by governments, just like we are seeing with TCFD, so the, the Task Force for Climate um, Related Financial Disclosures. Therefore, you know, further down the pipeline, we're going to see nature related financial disclosures around risks and opportunities be uh, required uh, for business to disclose them by governments. Now, why is this TNFD framework important? It will provide a gold standard for reporting on nature related risk. And this is particularly important from an investor's perspective. So from a portfolio perspective, they are able to compare apples uh, with apples. And moving forward, we need to see more integration uh, around assessing and disclosing nature and climate related risk. And this is where MBS has huge potential. Now, considering, as you said earlier, that MBS could uh, contribute uh, up to nearly 40% of GHG emission reductions by 2030, there's huge potential here for nature-based solutions as you described, to be good for um, biodiversity outcomes, but also for, for climate outcomes. So in summary, what's really important is that we have a standardized approach to assessing and disclosing nature-related risks that inform uh, nature-based investments. We need to move towards integrated approaches to assessing and disclosing nature and climate risks to really drive those investments where it's needed for both net zero and nature positive outcomes. Tom, I, I think and I'm, I'm really, really happy because I think something that we are really uh, lacking uh, globally to, to address uh, climate crisis is accountability and also comparis comparison. And I think it is really great that we can, that we will have something that will help us uh, compare apple with apples, as you said. Um, another question that I would have to you is not only about, you know, measurement, but both Daniel and Mao were already talking here about how important it is that we get the right skill. And, uh, you know, there is like uh, so much conversation right now, how to crowd in private sector, how to make sure that we really upscale and, and get the right uh, level of uh, fin financing and funding. I, I wanted to give your view, to get your views about this. Uh, where do you see the biggest opportunities? Also, I would say as it is an ADB, um, seminar, I was thinking, uh, would you give your views about the roles of these organizations and potentially the risking some of the solutions and they get it forward? Yeah, great question. And, you know, I guess there's two, two aspects to this. One is um, there's a huge appetite for private sector investment in into nature-based solutions. That being said, um, it requires some form of public uh, finance and particularly, as you said, to de-risk. You know, if you look at some of the the key commodities for a lot of business, they're actually quite low margin uh, and, and high risk. So if there's any um, uh, mistakes that happen in interventions, then it is a big risk for private sector companies. So often they need public sector finance to help de-risk some of those larger investments that they're making. And then that second point about scale, again, many uh, private sector organizations find can't find the right scale to invest in, particularly when you're looking at um, specific landscapes. So some of the models we're looking at are developing funds that could be available for multiple landscapes. So pro uh, multiple private sector and public sector funds can be pulled together into landscape funds that could be used for different landscape scenarios, for example. So one, I would say uh, we need to find models where we can really have this blended finance approach. So public sector finance can help to de-risk some of the private sector capital. 
And secondly, innovation around pooling funds that they reach the right scale where private sector can really lean in and provide that investment that they have available. Thank you so much, Tom. I think we've been talking for ages about uh, the risking and, and also, you know, crowding in private sector. This concept of pulling in uh, funds, I think it's really interesting to get the scale and also to really be able to start thinking big picture rather than uh, thinking uh, in silos, both as it comes to specific fund or specific uh, technology, but, but really to look at uh, where we can get the biggest, the biggest impact. Quick one, Daniel, um, the, the question to you, and, and uh, um, I don't know um, whether it, you can give us this um, insights, but we've been talking quite a lot about infrastructure, you know, blue, green, how, how important it is to really use the nature-based solutions as one of the drivers for the way how we're thinking about infrastructure. Any other specific sectors that you, in your experience, can share with us that are really very well placed to use this nature-based solutions? Well, uh, certainly, um, I think, um, you know, to put it simply, uh, uh, NBS has a number of uh, allies or friends, if you will. Um, in the intro, I already uh, uh, shortly touch upon circular economy. So I think uh, a circular economy um, uh, and, uh, and nature-based solutions can be sort of mutually enabled practices. Um, both, of course, have a strong economic component. And of course, if we look again at, um, at ecosystems and the place or natural ecosystems and our place within them and how we, um, also referring to, to Mawa, like how we design, um, let's say, our built environment, um, basically within the Engineered environment, circular economy is really important, also as an enabler for nature-based solutions. Just to give an example, when we look at um, when we look at circular economy, we have to revolutionize the way that um, value is added to commodities. That, of course, um, as Tom already pointed out, like uh, are extracted from the natural environment. So through the different manuf design, manufacturing. Uh, um, uh, parts of the chain, we come to the use phase of any type of end consumer product or public utility, whatever. And um, what we always forget is that after that use phase, so the end of life of any, let's say, uh, utility product or cons uh, end consumer product, there is the destruction of value. Now, the destruction of value is an important part of natural ecosystems. The big difference being that in the natural ecosystem um, uh, um, architecture, there is no waste. And you know, one's waste is the other one's nutrient. So circular economy typically is, let's say, that discipline um, within the um, uh, mainstream economic sector and also the private sector um, that is looking how to close these loops and sort of perpetuate um, the addition of value, whereas the destruction of value becomes addition of value, thereby also prolonging the use phase of any utility product or end consumer product. Now, this might sound a bit esoteric, and you'll ask what is the link to nature-based uh, solutions, but circular economy sort of has the DNA or is a uh, possible economic narrative that would work hugely to uh, enable mainstream and also upscale NBS practices, specifically, I'd say, within the urban environments, much more so than in the uh, 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 peri-urban and, and rural environments. So I, for us, circular economy, nature-based solutions, they go hand in hand, and we work you know, on different levels to, uh, to actually really roll this out and implement it. I hope I answered your question uh, in this respect. Yes, you did. And I think it is really great to see this uh, link. I, I think, you know, circular economy is something that so many people are talking about. It's good to know that uh, these two concepts are very close together and actually one effectively um, uh, underpins and, and supports the other. Well, maybe, maybe yeah. uh, I could add one thing upon this because uh, uh, here in the Netherlands and specifically where, where, where we are based at, so we're in the northern Netherlands in the city of Groningen. So we have the three northern provinces that six years ago, they made a regional pact on mainstreaming uh, circular economy. 
And we see now that the circular economy practices in, uh, in these three provinces really are mainstream. This created also a, um, let's say, an, uh, an uh, economic impetus to the region because any and all um, private ventures, but also investors looking you know, to invest in circular economy and nature-based solutions, they are very much now coming to this part of Europe. So um, typically, you know, this is not just a marginal development. It can really help to reshape, um, let's say, the economic narratives and also create new venture, private venture, on, uh, I'd say, a, a, a regional and national scale. How this works in the international context, that's more complex and maybe, you know, and that goes a, a bit beyond the scope and range of this discussion. It is, and I think it is almost like a separate conversation. I, I would assume also really fascinating one for for anyone to have. Mawa, I, I would uh, go back to you with one observation that I have after this, what is it, like right now, 15 minutes conversation. Um, it is great idea, fantastic concept, and I think both Daniel, uh, uh, Tom, and you really gave us great insights of how it can make an impact. But it also seems to me that you need to have so many stakeholders involved and engaged and really contributing to this whole concept that the stakeholder engagement and, and some sort of advocacy um, between, uh, between different groups is absolutely necessary. Would you be able to give your views of how you believe the government, the uh, civic uh, institutions and, and organizations can really bring this uh, collaboration and stakeholder uh, engagement to play as it comes to nature-based solutions? Surely, Aga. But before that, if you allow me, I would like to bring some examples from this Southeast Asia, uh, South Asia especially. Uh, on this nature-based solution, which uh, our government's now taking a lot of interest into. Uh, all these examples probably will be regional, like the mangrove forest, which we know both Bangladesh and India jointly are now looking at, because it's a wonderful uh, tool for cyclone and stormwater management. So that, that these are very important uh, lessons which gradually are coming to the different other communities. I would also like to refer here, which is not that so often referred or discussed, that is this Himalayan spring system. The entire Himalayan range, we are having so many countries, starting from Pakistan, uh, India, Nepal, Bhutan, and where we can see we are having a lot of uh, precipitation, but then also we are not being able to manage the water balance. So there we can see that now we are going back to understand the source management. So spring shed management is actually helping to get additional water source resource. So that so in addition, what we see in the urban areas now we are trying to do with the wastewater management so that we can get some additional water into the cycle. We can see also with the spring shed management, these are the things which are happening that we are getting uh, more amount of source for our application. So another application I would like to mention here that is very specific to our context, that is sewage treatment. We have East Kolkata wetland, which helps the metropolitan city of Kolkata to manage its sewage. And it's a wonderful support, whether you look at from the monetary side or you look at from the vegetable or fish production, or you look at from the CO2 sequestration, carbon sequestration, whatever way you look at it. So these are wonderful examples. So definitely I talk about this uh, uh, evaluation part and when we talk about this evaluation these examples are very very wonderfully uh, strong support to convince people because these are the evidences and as you talked about this I am coming to your question now as you asked about different stakeholders and their role 
Definitely, I believe each of these nature-based solutions, whether we try to look at the problem to understand the problem or the potential of these elements, we need to bring the at least the community and the local government in the in the in the scenario. Other than that, whatever you are trying to design, it will be only a desktop job. It's if, when you go for implementation, even if you implement it, its efficiency will be not up to that target. You will not be able to achieve that. So definitely stakeholders' participation is very, very important. And I can give you two wonderful examples here. Uh, I happen to be a member of Global Alliance for Disaster Research Institutes, GADRI. And there we had got an opportunity to develop a book, GADRI book series. And our book was Rajiv, Professor Rajiv and me. We were working on this ecosystem-based uh, approaches uh, for uh, this disaster risk and the climate change uh, mitigation. And there we could see that we looked at from the, not we, it's a wonderful uh, initiative from uh, 50 plus experts. And we have seen the policy side in a particular segment. The Another segment was designed for science and technology, which you already identified. Yes, that's a focus area. We are very much interested. Because without we believe without this science and technology, we cannot manage today's critical problem that we strongly believe. We cannot really repeat what it used to be 100 years back. It will not be able to manage this scale. And the third thing we have tried to do there is the case studies. So in these three segments, we have been able to really learn a lot about the stakeholders. Uh, so. This is not, the, we don't have that much time to discuss it in detail. And the similar thing we have tried to do in our South Asia Alliance for Disaster Research Institute, SADRI. And from this, we have a particular working group who are working on critical infrastructure. There is also another working group who are working on this nature-based solution. And there are a lot of synergies between these two groups. And we could understand that when you talk about this finance, management, policy, regional focus is very important. You cannot try to bring something very blanket solution which will work. No. There are a lot of similarities in the countries in the South Asian region. So when we have our discussions, we try to understand the problems and potentials, a lot of similarities are there. So the, maybe the solution side will also can gain, can really have a lot of good inputs from these similarities. But if, if we try to do that, uh, try to implement the learning from this region to other region in total, probably that will not be working. So that specificity is very important in nature research. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mawa. I, I will, you know, what you were just saying is, you know, really great that you gave us this uh, specific examples from Southeast Asia. But surprisingly enough, when you were talking about the approach, one project that I was very much involved in in Europe uh, came to my mind. It is we, we, we've done a couple of projects around uh, the concept called Just Transition. Just Transition is, I would say, broadly connected with nature-based solutions, but it is, you know, about sustainability and decarbonizing regions in, in Europe. And, and this approach of really having like the proper, uh, not only top-down, but also bottom-up approach with different stakeholders, people who are losing their jobs, people whom we need to upskill, reskill, um, also looking with you know, local communities, making sure how to, how to really involve them is, is something that uh, made me think how important it is and also sparked like, lots of innovation, people coming with their own ideas, many startups coming up. So I, I think this is exactly the way to go. And, and Daniel and Tommy were also um, uh, talking about it, how important it is that, first of all, we, we look um, at everything that is around nature-based solutions as, a, as, a, you know, as an ecosystem. And we have this uh, uh, opportunity and, and also the capacity uh, to look at the broad impact as it comes also to uh, people we are impacting and, and, uh, and the lives that, uh, that they 
you know, that, that is changing as it comes to um, uh, specific um, uh, projects that we are implementing. Uh, we are running out of time, so if okay for you, I will I will try to uh, summarize because I, I, I you know like put some notes about the key enablers, and, and I think you know we were talking about a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, that this ecosystem approach and stop thinking about silos, uh, looking at you know the, prob the problems that we need to tackle and have like a very consistent and also um, um, uh, big approach is something that is absolutely essential to, first of all, be able to decide for natural-based solutions, being able to look at specific sectors, as you were referring to, be it infrastructure, be it circular economy. So we need to have like a you know, like big picture and also very consistent way Way of uh, being able to compare apples with apples, as Tom, you were, referred, were referring to. Then, uh, you know, Daniel, a little bit from what I've heard from you, there is also an, some sort of an operational level, yes, that uh, to be able to do things, you need to have access to land, you need to have data sets, you need to have flexibility around the models and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, you know different methods that you are that you are using. Then we had like a very big topic around funding and investments, and uh, both Daniel, you and, and and you, Tom, in particular, were talking about how important it is. First of all, to be able to understand and measure the impact, uh, irrespective if you are institutional investors or a private investor, you want to have like the consistent metrics where you can compare different things and you can also uh, measure your own impact. And and also this statement about how important it is that there is some public money, uh, IFI's money, to, to be able to de-risk some of the initial stages, um, stages of, of um, investments and technologies. Built on this, I would say the big topic is also upscaling. And, and Mawa, you were referring so beautifully about, you know, to, to the uh, startups who have fantastic technological solutions that needs to be upscaled to really uh, to really have an impact. And, and I think it is like a, a big topic for us um, uh, to to focus on. And then Tom, referring back to your point about blending finance being able to you know to to, uh, to to bring different sources and pulling the different sources of finance to to find the right approach and the right solution and, and the final one uh, would be this uh, multi-stakeholders connections and engagement now what you were referring to to make sure that it is not only top down but also bottom up and, and making sure that whatever is being um, um, Finally decided on is, is inclusive and also uh, brings different different stakeholders to play. I, I have almost like you know so many so many we we, we just have an hour and we've um, covered so many things. I, I was thinking you know why don't we wrap up by you giving like your final statement? What would you like our audience to remember from this? Um, a specific panel. I know that we didn't cover everything. Uh, there is like a huge conversation around regulatory regime about the neighboring environment and so on. We didn't have time to do this, but just wanted to get your you know final points and, and sound bites, if you want, for our audience to remember. Well, shall I shall I take this first? Because that, that, that there's one that there's one thing I'd I'd like to refer back. You you mentioned uh, just uh, just transition, Aga. Also, in earlier conversations, you've mentioned the um, the uh, book by uh, uh, Matsukato, Mission Economy. So I think these two things they they connect together. Um, if, for instance, we look at the EU Green Deal and um, the you know the um, ensuing Just Transition Fund, which I'm sure you're familiar with, maybe the audience is less familiar with that. And if we look at um, the requirement for new economic narratives in order to allow nature-based solutions, circular economy, et cetera, et cetera, to come to the forefront and being able to upskill. And also coming back to this 37% that you mentioned in the beginning, how are we going to do that? And I think the best takeaway from this book, Mission Economy, is that there was a US government that decided mission first, budget doesn't play a role. I'm not saying that the EU Green Deal and Just Transition Fund is um, exactly um, the same. But we see, um, for instance, here in Northwestern Europe, the already the impact and the 
enabling capacities on all levels, on all verticals and horizontals of um, practices like nature-based solutions, circular economy and the likes. So I think that in the end of the day, we have to sort of transcend our narratives. We have to transcend the business as usual and be brave enough to look what's ahead exactly to be able to mainstream upskill and roll out nature-based solutions on a massive scale worldwide, uh, meeting the global challenges at hand. Thank you, Daniel. That's a beautiful way of um, uh, wrapping up uh, your part. Mao and Tom, uh, anything from you? Yeah, Aga, if uh, Tom, I can go first. Is it okay? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, Aga, I would like to say, I would like to repeat myself. Uh, if the uh, if the audience would like to remember something out of this discussion from my side, that should be let us mediate. Aim for monitoring the stresses and the opportunities or potential the natural elements are offering. E for evaluation so that we can really get funding and uh, support from the local government and others. D for design and design with the part, uh, participation of the stakeholders, especially the community. So we may use the term co-design and implementation so that with proper detailing so that it can really take care of the target for which we have started planning for it and continuously monitoring it. With that, I would like to start here. Thank, Thank you, Mama. Tom? Great, and I'm not gonna say anything new, but it bears repeating um, because it's it's so important. And, and the first is, you know, this cross-sectoral multidisciplinary approaches that we've been talking about, you know, that provides both a challenge and, and an opportunity. It's an opportunity because it enables us to make investments in nature-based solutions that have multiple benefits whether it's for climate, nature, society, different sectors, et cetera. But it's challenging because of that issue that you're dealing with multiple different sectors and disciplines and bringing them all to the table, making sure you know, they've all got skin in the game. And I think there's you know, something uh, that Daniel said, we need to work towards win, win, win. So beyond the sort of paradigm of win, win, you know, embracing multi-stakeholderism and making sure everybody um, is winning. I think that's something we need to move towards. And then the second piece is about value. You know, we, we really need to embrace the full value of nature, internalize all of those externalities of our economic development, and that starts to change the game. We start to then focus on investments that deliver most value, not those that are most cost effective. Lovely. Tom, Daniel, Mawa, thank you so much. It was absolutely fascinating conversation. Uh, I will take this opportunity and also um, say big thanks to ADB for, first of all, being a great promoter of uh, nature-based solutions and also creating this opportunity for us to have this conversation today. I hope that our audience um, also had such a fascinating um, uh, time as I did. Um, the one number that will stay in my mind after this conversation today is going to be 37. 37% 37 of potential mitigation that is to be achieved uh, on, by using uh, nature-based solutions is a big number uh, to me, and, and the game is really high. So I am really, really pleased that uh, uh, with you on board, uh, we had a chance today to hopefully give our audience a little bit better understanding of why nature-based solutions can be one of uh, uh, very uh, I would say big and, and powerful tool to um, achieve net zero and uh, rescue our planet. With this um, statement, I will conclude us. Thank you so much again for joining and I hope that you enjoyed it.